I'm Bob. I'm an alcoholic. If you could, if the adults would help the alcoholics take their seats. A couple announcements. At approximately 12:30, lunch is going to be served. It's part of the deal here. In the other room, in that room over there, should be very good. It's uh, it lobster tails, uh, crab legs, um, and there's tapes available of this weekend and other stuff and talks in AA out there. Uh, see the gentleman with this, the crazy growths coming out of his ears, uh, sitting behind the, the the bank of electronic apparatus. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ralph. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. I didn't know that coming out of chapter to the agnostic, we'd have born again. For, <laughs> amen. <laughs> any, Aaron, you want to pass the donation plate around to the... <laughs> Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. They're usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional Mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. Um, I talked to some people at the break, and I asked this question earlier, but we do like to get an idea of who's here. How many new friends do we have? How many people do we have in less than a year of recovery? Woo! Oh, my God. Welcome. And one question that many of you might ask, and I remember asking it, and you wanted the key questions, when am I ready to do steps? I've been sitting around here. I've been going to meetings. I did my 90 and 90. I, I'm, I've, I've got a home group. I've started taking commitments. When am I ready for these steps? If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. If you have decided you want what we have, and if you come from the dark place, hopelessness and futility of life as I have been living it, and decide that I want what I have, well, one of the reasons you'll hear, we haven't talked that much about it, but Alcoholics Anonymous has a symbol. It's not in the front of the book anymore. We lost the copyright, but we have a symbol. And it's a circle. Inclo that encloses a triangle, circles a triangle. And that triangle has three legacies, the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous, unity, recovery, and service. Bob and I talked about the first part of that. The, we talked about the unity, I, and it treats my body. I bring my body to the fellowship. I come to the fellowship. What we're doing today, we're fellowshipping it, and the unity of, of us coming together. And in, in one of the chapters we read, there is a solution. It talked about, you know, having, you know, uh, a common peril, having survived the common peril is one element in the cement that binds us together. We're all alcoholics, and we're all coming from that same dark place. And that's one element that binds us together. So for the people who raised their hands, it's new. Hopefully, I've been going the means. Hopefully I've gotten a home group in Alcoholics Anonymous, a place that's kind of like a cheers bar where everybody knows my name, where I can come in there and, and, and I come in and I do what it is that we do because I'm still pretty much full of character defects. We haven't even got to those steps. I'm still, still a guy that's a perpetrator. I'm a fraud and, and, and I'm a, a want to be like guy. So I go in a home group and I get the same answer every time somebody says, how you doing fine? And in a home group, the good news is they've seen me enough that they can decipher my answers for me. I can't see my own nose on my own face. So some of these old guys around here say, no, how you really doing? And they'll pull me to the side. 
or I'll get up to the podium at one of the meetings and I want you, you and I'll start spouting off some stuff that I may or may not know. I'll do something inappropriate in Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't trip off that, you know, because that's how I find out how to do what's appropriate. And somebody will gracefully, instead of at a meeting cutting me down, somebody who's been around here and knows how we do this will take me outside of the meeting at the end and say, Ralph, this is how we do it in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I go to meetings. That's the fellowship. And then the next part of the deal, recovery, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the 12 steps of recovery that's outlined in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're in a 12-step program, it makes sense to practice the 12 steps. You know, I'm not going to go sitting around a bar and look at you drinking and think I'm going to end up drunk. You know, I'm going to do what it is they do in bars for me to get the result I want to get. I'm going to drink for myself. So when I come in a 12-step program, I'm going to take the 12 steps for myself. I'm not going to see you doing so. I'll get in here and i do that. Then the third part, you know, is service. And at the end of those 12 steps of recovery, I get an awakened spirit, and I put that awakened spirit in the service. You know, and that's the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous. So the first deal that we talk about to our new friends, you might have been on just one side of that triangle for a while. I've been going to meetings. That's how most of us get here. And I fell in love with the fellowship before I fell in love with this process. I'm kind of different. The mo I, I, from the moment I came to stay, I love the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I love the stories. I you my kind of people. I love to get a spiritual experience with people who who cuss and use God in the same sentence. That works for me. I'm not a thee and thou guy. I'm not I'm not. I'm not one of them. I'm one of the people that I stumble and I fall and it's not a judgment that's on that. You know, that's we stumbling people and we staggering people and we falling people and we and that's so you're my people. So I fell in love with the fellowship before I fell in love with the process. But after coming to meetings and coming to meetings and coming to meetings, I'm hopeful that the reason that so many new people are sitting here right now, you get to a point and you say, Well, when am I ready for these steps that you guys are talking about? Because it's from going to meetings that I hear about this. I hear about this process. I hear about this big book. I hear about these 12 steps. I hear about this new life. I hear about this new way of living. I hear about this awakened spirit. I hear about this, this character building. I hear about this growing up to be a grown man for the first time in my life. I was 33 years old, and I had been playing at being an adult all my life. Grown people were other people. Don't know if anybody else can identify with that. And you know, sometimes they still feel like they're other people. And I'm, I'm, I'm 55 years old. And sometimes it still feel like adults to other people. You know, because being grown is hard work. You know, I still like summer vacation. I, I, and you don't get summer vacation. from Once you're grown, you're grown. And I don't know. I have kids that's grown, and they somehow, some way, you guys have put something in me that I've been pulling this daddy thing off without me feeling like that. But anyway, so I get to this point. When am I ready to take these steps? If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any mess to get it. And I'm an any less kind of guy. That's who I am. See me in the life and you'll know that's who I am. I go to any less. So if you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any less to get it, you're ready to take certain steps. You know, we read this at the beginning of every meeting. And I'll usually start thinking it's the most important part of the program. And it's really not more important than anything else. It just distills the essence of our 12 steps. And at the end of the 12 steps, it says, our description of the alcoholic, we went through the doctor's opinion all the way up through, you know, more about alcoholism. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, step two, and our personal adventures before and after, my experience, strength, and hope. You know, the personal adventures of people before coming and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. C, that God could and would if he were so. Being convinced, we were at step three. Being convinced, two words tell me a lot about steps one and two. Those two words tell me all I need to know about steps one and two. Being convinced, steps one and two are conclusions I draw based on my experience. They're conclusions I draw based on my experience. 
The reason we spend so much time on them is not to tell you that you're powerless and you it's to point out that and confirm what I know about myself. I just didn't know the words to put to it. I didn't know that's what it was. When I looked at the doctor's opinion and the doctor described an allergy, the doctor didn't give me the allergy. The doctor described the allergy. I matched my experience up against what the doctor said in this thing, and I said, that's me. That's me. I looked at the countless number of times I started and couldn't control how much I took. And I looked at the countless number of times I tried to stop and couldn't stop starting again on my own. Step one. I looked at the countless promises I made to my mother, to my wife, to employers, to police officers. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. They couldn't stop me from doing it. I couldn't stop me from doing it. Conclusions I draw based on my experience. No human power could stop me. Catapulted me into that second step. If no human power could do it, I needed a power that could. You know, Conclusions I draw. Made it, came to believe that a power greater than me could restore me to sanity. And the deal about the second step, I don't culminate the second step in the second step. I'll get the results of step two, and I'll culminate step two following step nine. When we talk about the tenth step, it'll talk about, for by now, sanity has returned. And we'll get to that, hopefully, probably tomorrow. But the culmination and the realization, so step two is a conclusion I draw. The rest of the steps, three through 12 actually, but three through four through nine specifically, but three through 12 are the 10 step program of action that makes that second step come alive. Step one is the problem, step two is the solution. The rest of the steps are the 10 step program of action to get me to that. Third step, made a decision to turn my will. Some people do it in a shortcut way. Bob will probably expand on that definition. Shortcut definition, new friend, made a decision to turn my will, which is my thinking and my life, which is my actions, over to the care of God as I understood him. You know, and we talked a lot about, but I don't have an understanding of God. And in that step two that we just did in the chapter to the agnostic, I don't need to have a full-fledged understanding for me to commence to get results. I can commence to get results from the moment I express even a willingness to believe. I can commence to get results right then. Okay, now I start to, I'm willing to believe. What do I do? It's something I have to do. I'm a, I'm a feeling guy and I'm a showing guy and, and I'm not a for real guy at all. I'm more interested in what I can convince you of than what I really am. I'm not interested in telling the truth. I'm convinced that you. I'm interested in convincing you that I am. I'm not interested in you know that that's that's always how I've been. Not so much interested in having any substance and character. I'm just interested in making you believe that I look like what I let what I want you to think I am. And so now I'm embarking on a process that's a little bit different. Second step. Came to believe. So what do I do with that coming to believe? Well, now I make a decision. And the third step is a promise to submit to the rest of the process. The third step really does not involve, oh, the third step is a decision. Okay. I believe Bob said he got my back. I believe that if I gave you know that he'll go and take care of everybody. Okay, I believe it. Okay. So now I make a decision. Bob said he'll do whatever it is to take to make this meeting come about. I believe he will. I'm going to make a decision to give him the money to go out and buy the coffee and the door and the rest of that stuff. I made a decision, but I haven't reached in my pocket, but we haven't talked about that. I made a decision to turn my will and my life over. Why do I make that decision? Being convinced, it says. Being convinced, we were at step three, which is we decided to turn our will and life over to God as we understood him. Just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? What do we mean by turning, making a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as we understood him. The next paragraph goes on and it talks about the first requirement for turning the will and the life over. What do we mean by that and what do we do? There's another part on page 62 at the bottom. It says this is the how and the why of it. It says what do we mean by that and what do we do? This is how we turn our life over and this is why we turn our life over. First of all, we had to quit playing God. That's how I turned it over. 
Why do I turn? Why would I quit playing God? Don't worry. For you biblical scholars, it'll say thou, you know, there are commandments that say thou shalt have no other God before me. And, you know, and so it's virtuous and it's the right thing. And you'll go to hell if you put something there to God. And if, if you try to, for me, I like pragmatic and I like practical. Quit playing God, Ralph. Why? Don't worry. <laughs> Not because it's virtuous, not because it's the right thing, not because it is not godly and it's not righteous and you will go there. Don't work. <laughs> Does not work. How do I know that? I played God my whole life. We'll later on talk about in this chapter, it talks about most people live by self-propulsion. You know, the first requirement is I be convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success. It says I be convinced that any life run on self-will, I make it personal for me. I be convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success. What would make me believe that me running my life on my will is not successful? Is anybody in here running their life successfully? Because if you are, don't worry about step three. Don't even just sit in here with the rest of us, kind of audit the course, you know, and go out and, you know, you know, we'll see. That, that, I'm not tripping. I really am like that. I do sponsorship. I, I, I'm, if I like it. You, if you like it, I love it. You know, if your life run on your will is successful, why would you take step three? Why would you turn it over to somebody else? If you're successfully doing anything, why would you stop? But for those of you like Ralph, whose life is a train wreck, right, not only waiting to happen, but it, that has happened over and over and over again. For those of you who run in the walls all the time. For those of you who run into problems in relationships all the time. For those of you who were phone page 52, who have problems with the emotional nature. Who just sometimes just don't want to get up out the bed. I just want to pull the covers up over my head because life just seems too hard for me. I just start crying when I don't want to and don't even know why I'm crying. I just keep getting fired from jobs and I just can't stop from cussing the boss out of telling them about themselves. I keep having the same relationships with the same people getting the same results, same face different for those of you like that keep bumping heads with everybody that's close to me in my life i feel useless and i feel unnecessary and i feel worthless i'm still always fearful about being able to make my, i can't seem to make a living and i'm just always in some stuff if my life is like that i feel on a treadmill and i feel hopeless about my prospects you know, we don't do this because it's, it's, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous for me is not an intellectual exercise. I'm not in here because it's a, it's a good thing and it's chic to be sober in 2009. I do it because I'm desperate and I do it for my life. And I did it on that basis at first for a long time. And then it started, I started liking the taste of this new way of living. I started liking what it feels like to be grown and act grown and be accountable and be respectful. didn't start like that. New friends, don't trip off that. Do it the way I did it at the beginning. I don't know. I'm not a nice guy. All the ass on the line. We're not here for soul saving. We're here for ass saving. And if yours is like that, you know, that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. And I came in here in a desperate condition. So all of you guys that raise your hands, you know, that's why we, I understand. So if you're sitting in here and you want a new way of living, want a new way to go, something new and different in my life, I'm sober and I don't want my life to look the same way sober as it did when I was out there. I want to be a mother to my kids or I want to be a father. I want to be a man or a woman in my house. I want to be able to make a living. I want to realize some dreams and some goals and some aspirations. I want to have some ambitions. I want to laugh again. I want the light to be on in my life again. You know, I want to enjoy this deal. I want to live before I die. If you're in that number, that what we do, Bill called a man or a living. It's a man or a living. It's a lifestyle. And so the first requirement on this third step is I be convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success because I'm always in collision with other people. Go through a long thing where we talk about the actor, and then Bill makes an analogy, you know, and I, and I like it because life is a stage. You know, and I'm the kind of guy that on in, in, in the stage play that's my life, I'm always the leading man. You know, and imagine that. Because in your play, you the leading man. And all our lives intersect. And it's a cold thing. That's why it says living by self-propulsion. I'm always in collision with somebody or something. Because how dare you step on my stage and be had a nerve to talk. You don't even have a speaking line. You are extra. But I don't realize... <laughs> 
I don't realize I'm the extra in your play. So now we're sitting here because I'm always the leading man, you know. Whoever imagined the director, uh, here it is, I'm a bit player, but I don't know it. So I'm on the stage, the extra, trying to be the director, I'm the producer, I'm the script right. You're not saying your lines right, you know, and you're doing the same thing. So we're colliding, we're colliding, we're colliding. And it makes that kind of analogy. Talks about, you know, how it is that I try to impact and affect other people. You know, one of the things that's in my story is, you know, I'm, I'm desperate for you to like me, and, I'm, I'm, and I really am trapped in what I think you think. So I want to mold your opinion and your ideas about Ralph. So I'm sometimes gracious, I buy you. Sometimes I bully you. Sometimes I manipulate you. Sometimes I con you. All of this to do. And I'm a victim of the delusion that if only I manage better that I could get. The book talks about resting, satisfaction, and happiness. Out of this. And that word rest, what does it remind you of? Wrestling. You know, what kind of, and so I'm in this grappling idea that I'm going to just rest. I'm going to grapple with this life deal, and I'm going to make it become out the way that I want. And the cool thing about it is, you know, when I write the script and when you say your lines right, it still might not turn out right. You know, I would be rolling with my, I could remember, you know, because I am a geographically challenged. I don't do maps. You know, in L.A., if, in, if you're in L.A., you could live there all your life like I do. Still need, you know, map quest to go anywhere. You know, and I'd be driving, I'd be with my wife, and we'd be driving, and, and we're lost. And I don't, of course, ask. I'm just driving. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, I'd say, you know, you know, and I'm just driving, and she trying to backseat drive or passenger seat drive. I don't pay any attention. And then this one day, you know, I'll pay attention, you know, and she'll say, go left, and we go left, and we get more lost. And now, you know, I'm going to say, well, why the hell would you tell me? Well, you never listened to me. No way. Why you choose to listen to me now? So now, you know, it never comes out right. Now, I'm wrong for listening. She's wrong for helping. Because before, how come you didn't know? How come you didn't say anything? It doesn't matter what lines you say, you know. And, and I'm a victim of this idea that if only I manage. But this God idea is big. It's bigger than I know it to be. And there's layers to it. And most of the time, I fall victim to that with good intentions. With good intentions. I told you I'm a parent. You know, and I am a victim of the idea that I could, everybody will be happy if you follow what it is that I say. I had to do the God thing with my stepson because I wanted to play God in his life. Even with a good intention, I want you to be sober. But I want more for you than you want for you. I want different for you than what you want for you. And the, it's not wrong to want that. The, but the idea that I could manage that and everybody would ha be happy based on my management skills, that's the problem. I used to come in the house. I'd see him in the house. I would immediately, in spite of myself, in spite of myself, self can't overcome self, I would not have the ability to restrain my tongue. And my, his little sister, who still adores her big brother and idolizes him, and I cut that young man down. And it was out of my frustration, out of my frustration. If only I manage better. It's something I'm not doing. Isn't he seeing my example? Isn't he seeing his mother's example? Isn't he seeing his uncle's examples and his aunt's examples? I need to talk to him better. I need to talk to him rougher. I need to talk to him harsher. I need to, I need to lay down the law more firmly. I need to give him his consequences. And I'm doing and now. If only he would listen. And then River takes up for, no, I told you don't open the door for me. And now the whole house is in turmoil, not because of myself, because of me. I'm a victim of the delusion that I can rest satisfaction and happiness out of it if I manage better. It's got to be me. It's, 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 I have the ability, you know, because, because it's the right thing to want for somebody, right? You know, there's plenty of people in here that just want your mate. You want what's right for them. You know, that's why, you, you know, sometimes somebody in here might have a mate or something that just can't get this thing. And you'll take them to a meeting and you want them to hear with your ears. They'll, Bob will be sharing, you'll be nudging them. I hope you're getting it. You, you listening to this? You, <laughs> you ever want somebody sober more than they want to be sober? Somebody in here might be going through that. 
you know, going through those things. So the victim of the sad idea, and it runs real deep. Victim of the delusion, you know, that I could rest satisfaction and happiness. And so then I bump into other people, you know. Selfishness, self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fears, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. Step on the toes of our fellows and retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that sometime in the past, we've made decisions based on self that later put us in position to be hurt. Second favorite sentence in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. We read my favorite sentence in the last chapter, you know, that God does not make too hard a terms with those who seek him. Here's my second favorite. Hell of a promise. Doesn't sound like one. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. Why do you like that sentence so much, Ralph? Because if the problem is in me, the solution is in me. I don't have to, have to wait for you to get better for me to get better. I don't have to wait for you to get better for me to get better. Our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They come from inside of me, and I'm an extreme example of self-will run riot, even though I don't think so. It talks about being rid of this selfishness, and God makes that possible. Self can't overcome self. How I know that, I've tried. I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. You know, I don't have the ability to overcome self. Somebody was talking to me yesterday about, Ralph, how come, where do I get to this other level of surrender? You know, I've surrendered when it comes to alcohol. You know, how do I get to this other level of surrender when it comes to everything else? Selfishness and self-centeredness. This, we think, is the root of our problems. And I don't need to find the recipe for how do I think my way out of that trap. The good news about the 12 steps of recovery, do the deal. Do the process. The process will turn over my will and my life. Do the deal. We'll talk about the succeeding steps. And each one of those succeeding steps are going to have the, what they're going to have is the force and effect of introducing me to, of clearing away the rubble we talked about in that second step. They're going to have a force and effect of clearing away what's blocking me. They're going to have a force and effect of clearing away and putting me more in touch with this power that I need. Same power in the same process that took the bottle out of my mouth is the same power in the same process that will do for me everything else that I do. The selfishness and the self-centeredness, you know, that's the root of my problem. Um, Some succeeding steps, all the rest of those steps are, prob are, are going to be, um, Bob talked about the purpose of this process, then I'm going to turn it over to him. The whole intent of what it is that we do in the 12-step process, it's all about the deflation of ego. And my ego wants to live. Well, what the hell is my ego anyway, Ralph? I'm talking about deflation of ego. You know, self, Bob talks about it all the time, you know. Spiritual path and, and living a spiritual life has nothing to do with acquisition. It has nothing to do with addition. It's all about subtraction. And when it starts, when it talks about it right here, it talks about getting rid of self. Everything we talk about in the book, it never talks about when it comes to character building, when it comes to everything. It never talks about, Ralph, what you need to be get. It always talks about being rid of, casting off, abandoning. Look at the words in here. Everything that it's going to talk about on a spiritual path. And then see what you left with. See what you left with and build on that. But the first thing is about all, everything for, all, for people of my variety is about getting rid of self. Deflation of ego. I can sit in here and I can read this book and I can go to this workshop on this weekend. And I can go to workshops just like this. And I can use this process for exactly the opposite of what it's intended to do. I could gain knowledge and information. And this is not about the acquisition of knowledge and information. But I can do that. I can gain knowledge and information. I can quote page line references in this book. I can tell you where everything is. And I can make my whole intent to be the person who's the best at taking people through the work. The way that I do it. And I can use this process to inflate my ego as opposed to deflate my ego. Whole purpose of this is self getting rid of self, self abandonment, whole deal. Whole deal, we just talked about it. That's the root of my problems. And the rest of what it is that we'll be talking about from, from, the, third, from the fourth step on has to do with that idea. 
self-abandonment and getting rid of self, and that Ralph can't do it. So it's about getting in touch with the power, growing, talks about enlarging and perfecting later on in one of our steps, but it's about growing that conscious contact, growing the relationship, making power bigger and Ralph Littler. Power bigger, Ralph Littler. Power bigger, Ralph Littler. Whole purpose of the whole deal. And remarkable stuff happens when that happens. Paradox about the spiritual life. I never think that. I think me little means me being able to be dominated. Me little means me being weak. Me little means being at your mercy. Me little means you being able to take advantage of me. Me little means who's going to take care of me and who's going to have But what I realize is that me taking care of me, me running on my own power, and me having running the show has not worked. If I ain't to that point, I, it's going to be hard for me to get little. Though I am already. I just don't know it. Last one to know. Thanks, Ralph. I'm <clears throat> Bob. I'm still an alcoholic. Some of you may be sitting here as I sat in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous listening to all this, this wonderful spiritual stuff, and you're thinking, man, I'm not going to be able to do this. Turn my will and my life over to the care of God. I know what that means. That means i got to forget about myself. How can I do that? I can't do that. Make amends. Devote my life to this. Oh, my God. I, you people sound so well, for God's sakes. Well, there's only one significant do not in the big book. Do not be discouraged. Mm -hmm. And then it follows that up with says, no one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to this to these pro, to this program, to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we're willing to grow along spiritual lines. If you can say to yourself, this seems unobtainable, but what the heck? I'm gonna start heading in that direction. Let's see what happens. And I, I think the great saving grace in Alcoholics Anonymous is that we, we, we realize the reality of alcoholism is that it's a chronic rather than acute spiritual malady. So we're always going to live with the propensity to play God. We're always going to live with the con inclination to be self-centered and judgmental and lustful and prideful and greedy and jealous and envious. And, and we're always going to have the inclination to be the guy in the room that knows what's wrong with everybody. You know, we're all that pathetic, childish stuff that the inclination for that is always going to be with us. How many, how many people here in this room are sober over 26 years? Two people. I want to read a letter that Bill Wilson wrote when he was over 26 years sober. One of the things I really uh, have come to love about Bill Wilson, who was the, who was the first person to ever get sober, when he wrote this letter, he was the, he was the oldest old-timer on the planet. He was over 26 years sober. Here's the guy who wrote, for the most part, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 by 12, the guy who really was the channel for God to bring us this program of recovery. And yet he was very flawed. He never, he never completely outgrew himself. And that's one of the things I just have always loved about Bill. <clears throat> when he was 26 years sober, a group in Chicago had been watching him, and they noticed he was imperfect. And they wrote him in a very, very in-depth letter about what was wrong with him. I, I don't think Bill had to do a, do a 10-step for at least two years. <laughs> they were very thorough. They were very thorough and fearless and thorough from the very start they were. And they took his inventory and they took it harshly. And here's the letter he replied to them with. 26 years sober. 
not perfect, but something I think more important. He says that to the group in Chicago, that you seem disillusioned with me personally may be a new and painful experience for you, but many members have had that experience with me. <laughs> Most of their pain has been caused not only by my several shortcomings, but by their own insistence on placing me a drunk trying to get along with other folk upon a completely illusionary pedestal, a station which no fallible person could possibly occupy. I'm sure you will understand that I have never held myself out to anybody as either a saint or a superman. I have repeatedly and truthfully said that AA is full of people who have made more spiritual progress than I have, have or can make, that in some areas of living I have made some decided gains, than in others I have seemed to have stood still, and in still other ways I may have even gone backwards. I am sorry that you are dis disillusioned with me, but I am happy that even I have found a life here. Bill Wilson, 1960. I would rather have that humility than all the perfection in the world. One of the, the Benedictines have a, a vision of, of spiritual growth that fits a guy like me very well. And it's not growing towards perfection. They say spiritual growth is an increasing awareness of our own fallibility and limitations and an increasing awareness of God's incredible generosity. Of myself, I am nothing. The Father doeth the work. I will always have a natural inclination to self-centeredness. And self, which the book equates with ego, on the bottom of um, page 61, at the very first line of the f last paragraph, it says, our actor is self-centered, dash, long dash, means, here's like, Another word for the same thing. Egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. In other words, when, they're, when, when we talk about ego and we talk about free me from the bondage of self, we're talking about free me from the bondage of ego. When I got that the book was equating those two things, all of a sudden I was able to reconcile the writings of Dr. Harry Tebow, Carl Jung, and the big book all, all of a sudden that they're talking about the same thing. They're all talking about the same thing. People say that ego is edging God out. It is the one thing that separates me from God and consequently separates me from you. And isn't it odd that in Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't grow closer to God by learning and understanding God. We grow closer to God by getting ourselves and then jettisoning the aspects of ourselves that interfere with our relationship with God. A, a hot air balloon does not have to find the sky. It just has to jettison the ballast that holds it back. Chuck Chamberlain used to say, you don't have to find God. You just have to abandon yourself of self and God shows up. God deplores a vacuum. He will come wherever there's room. And we're really making room. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple things in here in this. Uh, we're we're going to take a break for lunch real quick in about three or four minutes. Uh, one, of the, one of the old timers in AA came to me when I was new. And he, we, had a, we had a dialogue. And the dialogue was really evidenced was really evidence that I had, unbeknownst to me, had surrendered to some degree and didn't know it. Because surrender doesn't, you know, we, you, you think from, you go to enough meetings, you get, a, you get this idea that surrender is make, makes you happy, joyous, and free. Surrender to me felt like my life was over. <laughs> I mean, it did, I didn't feel happy, joyous, and free. I felt, I felt like, it's come to this. 
surrendering and finding yourself an active, participating, willing member of Alcoholics Anonymous, initially, now eventually, there's a joy. It is, eventually, it is happy, joyous, and free, but initially, it's when you're the new kid of the block here and you've got more alcoholism than you got recovery, this is not a comfortable place for a little while. I, my favorite... My favorite description of what it feels like to end up in AA was by a, a great a guy that helped me a lot, Joe McQueenie. He died a few years ago. He was the original Joe from Joe and Charlie. And Joe said that when he ended up in AA, he said he felt like he joined the Salvation Army band. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As a musician, I get that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This guy Joe, this guy, this other guy Joe, called, cornered me when I was new, and after a meeting, and he said to me, he says, he says, kid, he says, you have to take step three. And I knew Joe was a good guy; he'd helped me a lot, and I, I was honest with him. I, even though in meetings sometimes I talked like I believed in God, it was talk. I just wanted your approval, really. And I said to Joe, I said, Joe, I, I, the truth is, I don't think I can take step three. And he says, how come? He says, why? I don't believe in God, really. I mean, I'm not fighting it like I used to, but I don't know if there's a God or not. He said, he said to me something I'd never heard in Alcoholics Anonymous before and haven't heard, I don't think, to this day. He said to me, he says, kid, you don't have to believe in God to take step three. And I said, I'm looking at the third step on the wall. I said, Joe, yes, you do. It says we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. I don't even know if there is a God, let alone understand him. He says, listen, kid, in your case, if you'll turn your will and your life over to this chair, and he points to a chair in the meeting, he says, I promise you an instant miracle. I thought, what the hell? All right, Joe, I turn my will and my life over to the chair. What's the miracle? He says, oh, the, chair, the miracle would be is your life's no longer in the hands of an idiot. <laughs> and when he said that, I didn't even get mad. I just thought, yeah, that would probably be right. Because um, if you would have followed me around the last few years prior to that drunk and sober now this you can't i can't blame my i'm not a knucklehead only when i drink actually sometimes i'm worse when i'm sober and you'd have followed me around you'd be easily come to the conclusion whoever's making decisions for this guy is out to kill him and yet isn't it odd that it never looks that way up here never there was a guy dale who died of cancer with a, he was a great member of AA, kind of a gruff guy. One of those kind of guys that never smiles except with his eyes, but he smiles with his eyes all the time. He, it was like he was sort of had some kind of vested thing and looking grumpy. I don't know. He was just like he was grumpy, but he was always lit up. He was a cool guy. He always had great things to say. He cared a lot about new people. Dale came up to me after a meeting one time, and he's, this is a gruff voice. He says to me, he says, listen, kid, I'm going to tell you some stuff that's going to save you a lot of grief if you'll buy it. He says, I want you to know that when you're explaining something, you're defending something, you're rationalizing something, or you're justifying something, kid, I want you to know you're wrong. Because you never have to explain, justify, defend, or rationalize what's right. That was, God, 29 years ago probably, he cornered me and told me that. And to this day, all these years later, he's been right. that's been right every time. Every time I catch myself explaining the situation or justifying my position, Dale's voice rings in my head and I know, eh, I'm, I'm wrong, I'm out of line again. Because if I wasn't out of line, I wouldn't have to justify being out of line. You know, isn't it funny when you're doing right action, there's no, there's no you don't need to explain anything. It just is. Do you ever have to go to your sponsor and explain that you, I help you help, I just had to explain. I had to help. I had to help guys today. It was. I'm sorry. I did. You never have to explain that. <laughs> now you might explain why he saw you in coffee with some new person <laughs> of the opposite sex. Uh, might have to explain that, uh, but you never have to explain what's right. Let's take a break for lunch, and we'll be back here in one hour.